I don't even know which day it is today, so I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. uh, and uh, so Pat has now found his way back into the band playing the uh, electronic part of his setup. Like normally, his what you see on that side, on this side, is integrated into one big drum kit. And now we have Elvin McRae on the acoustic drums and Pat Maslotto on the electronic drums. And we're going to play one of the more recent pieces uh, from the Stigma catalog. Uh, this piece is from the album Tentacles and it's called Ringtone.
see, I see a lot of friendly faces, people I know, some people who I haven't seen before. A lot of t-shirts that I'm loving, like that one. Thanks for being here. We played last night in where was it? Benton Harbor, so am I right that we went? <laughs> yeah, and a uh, uh, relatively easy day. We have some days on tour that are really long drives, really complex. But always great to be here in Detroit and have a lot of friends. Uh, next on our set, this is uh, oh, I should mention to you, we're going to talk a little bit more and a little bit. The feel is a little bit more behind the scenes of this tour. It just wasn't a plan until Pat uh, was it at the first show, and it just kind of developed, and we kind of liked it that way. So we'll be telling a little, some stories. We'll even take some questions and answers, like whatever you want to ask about. And uh, I want to say as a background to this next piece, in my history, way back in 76, I was called by luck to play on this guy, Young Guy's album, Peter Gabriel. I didn't know who he was. one of the guitar players, and geez, I'm still making music with both of them after quite a few years. So that's been great. And then Robert made a solo album and decided to ask me to, it wasn't a King Crimson album, it was a Robert Fripp album called Exposure, asked me to play for this Bands play the music from that, but we uh, really enjoy playing this piece. With the heavy lifting is up to Marcus, and uh, I did, I must admit, play the bass guitar on the original album, but it's fun to play it and stick. So here is Breathless.
And you know, it's, it's amazing, we have double drumming now. Like, this is really, as you know, it's a rare thing to have two drummers on stage. And they're changing it up every night. So it's, it's a surprise for Tony and I when they're doing that. I think it's really a very good enjoy it. Uh, there's so much, you know, even though these are fixed compositions, there's so much room for interpretation and improvisation. And even in a part with that I play, there's, there's, you know, there are fine details that you can change every night. And it's, uh, thank you for being here so we can do this. Uh, yes? So, so I want to say something about the way that we uh, sort of have to handle the tours now. This wonderful lady there at the merch table, that's Deborah Mastelotto, that's Pat's wife. One of the reasons why I came her is that uh, Pat and Deb will share a bed. <laughs> if you know what I mean. <laughs> right? So, <laughs> anyway, so the, as you know, like the costs have gone up so much for all of us these days, and with the touring, um, it's, really, it's really hard to, to make that money back that we spent into putting these shows on the road, and that's why we have, you know, the merch. The merch is the one thing that if you want to support the band, you know, get something. And we have very special items. We have the t-shirts, which are unique for this tour. There's a short tour, only two weeks, 12 shows. And uh, also I had, uh, I maybe tell you a little bit of this backstory. There's a new EP with five live tracks, which I think is the best sounding statement uh, live recording that we have. Um, the reason why that came about is that the festival where we played in um, Spoleto in Italy, it was a beautiful, beautiful theater last year in November we played there. And uh, the, the people, they had a great uh, filming team there. They filmed the whole show with like eight cameras or something. And they made a video and put it up on YouTube without telling us really. And I found it and the video looked amazing. But the sound was horrible. Like we felt ashamed looking at it. So I said, okay, like I've got to go do something about it. And that's why I had these tracks mixed that you can find on the EP. The EP is called Swimming in Tea. And we have 300 copies of it. We have, uh, yeah, I mean, I would appreciate it if you would buy it. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. So a big part of Stickman shows are improvisations. And now with this double uh, drumming setup, it's very exciting for us. That's also why I guess Pat will start, or the drummers will start. So it's uh, okay, just enjoy. This is the uh, token lounge improv. <laughs>
so uh, yeah, improv, you know, that's part of what we do. And the other thing that we do is uh, we are kind of in the lineage of a band called King Crimson. And Tony, Tony, he uh, has been part of King Crimson since the early 80s, and since the early 90s. And uh, we're going to play a piece from the 70s, believe it or not. Maybe the oldest piece we're playing. And I'm seeing some t-shirts here. Yeah? So this is going to be Lars Tonson Aspen Part 2.
well, welcome for Robert Fraz and our sound engineer. He's right here. It's here, Robert. He's got the microphone for you guys. Okay. We're going to do a little bit of a QA. We have 10, 12 minutes for this. All right. Uh, this cable isn't too long, so I'm going to ask anyone who wants to ask questions to stand up and get my attention. Uh, but in the meantime, I'll ask the first question. Pat, how are you feeling today? I feel good, Fraza. I feel very good. Hey, Pat, what's up? I'm going to take a joke. Do you want to do anything? I'll get back to that, but don't let me forget, okay? He's got much better drumming and ears than I do over here. Elvin McCray did a great job. Yeah, so I had a hard issue, and I had some surgery about a week and a half ago, and they let me out last Sunday. It was one week ago today that I was able to come and see these guys at Shane Hall in Milwaukee. And uh, was out there in the back as part of the audience. And then uh, a day or two later, I think it was, maybe, uh, we concocted this idea that maybe I can just add uh, some electronics and he doesn't have to worry about all those details. And uh, the main advice from the, from the surgeon in the hospital uh, is just not flap my arms around too much. So, <laughs> and, and my wife, Deborah, the nurse at Stuart Birch, is, uh, she's out of view right now, so maybe I'm flapping too much, but I'll slow down as the night goes Okay. Just, oh, just briefly. Well, I, I've been wearing a pacemaker since 2021, right in the middle of the Crimson Tour of 21. I had a, a, an episode where I ended up on the floor of a shitty little uh, hotel in Kingston, the Super 8. And, uh, and then they put me on a stretcher and I woke up in an ambulance and uh, I was in the ER there and then they star flight, it was a star flight to the Westchester Art Hospital. It's been a couple days there, they put a chip in me, they let me out and I had a pacemaker. Everything's been cool for a year or two, and now I've got some kind of infection a few weeks ago, maybe a week and a half, 12 days ago. At first we thought it was a spider bite. I live in Texas, so they thought it was a spider bite. So I kind of blew it off for uh, Saturday and Sunday, and Monday we went in to see the doctor who did some stuff we don't need to get into, and put me on an antibiotic. I came up to play with these guys. Joined you on Tuesday and Wednesday we rehearsed. Thursday morning I got the call much before 11, and an email and a text and all that stuff. I get to email right the way. Uh, it's the wrong antibiotic, and, uh, and uh, then they transferred me to a heart hospital there. They thought they were going to take the pacemaker out. They did not. It did not penetrate the pacemaker sack. So, all's good if I just don't flap around too much. <laughs> I know if you guys are having as much fun playing as you're sitting back here listening. Because I have not had so much fun. Yeah. I can attest to the fun of it. It was bittersweet sitting in for Pat um, the first night because I was just mostly worried about him and I was also in the literal hot seat. Um, but uh, after you know charting the material you know, this for the second show, starting to settle into things, and now having Pat back on the stage with us, I couldn't be happier. I feel like he's going to be in the theater, just a good jacket. He's got all that on now, even the drumming. Hi, Tony. Remember 2014 on the boat? I was there, remember me? <laughs> This is a test, I might not pass it. I'm just going to say, hey, how you doing? <laughs> well, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Good. That's but good. I got this little memory block. I got a handful of slides from a Peter Gabriel show about 40 years ago in Ann Arbor. I think it was. Ann Arbor. I'm a star or something. I can't remember very well. But I got this picture of you with Gabriel, and you're playing a bass drum. 
Do you remember what song that might have been? <laughs> it's only 40 years ago, so my memory is pretty good for the years. Years. And I was, you know, I was still learning. <laughs> Thank you for that question. I haven't thought back to that for a while, but Peter, on that tour, as some of the people in the audience know who were at that. Who was at that tour? Yeah, all right. So, so we entered from the back. Yeah. It was a Spinal Tap idea. We'll just go through the basement, come up in the back when people are ready to see us, uh, and we'll say hello, Cleveland. You know. Uh, so we came in from the back playing bass drums and and slowly pushed our way through the audience to get to stage. And gradually, the audience realized that this is Peter Gabriel and the band coming in from the back, which is a kind of cool idea, very radical of Peter. Only some nights, especially near the front of the stage, people were standing, not sitting. And they didn't look behind them to see if it happens to be Peter Gabriel with a bass drum. So they wouldn't move. So we, increasingly, as the tour went on, we had trouble getting to the stage, which is why I mentioned Spinal Tap. We were stuck in the audience playing bass drums. Larry Fast on stage playing the synthesizer. And everybody thinking Peter's going to fly out of the wings. Thanks for reminding me of that. Time. The jerk who interrupted you on your phone calls in parking lot, but uh, I just wanted to say pieces of the song. It's one of my favorite albums. I really enjoy it. I got to see you live. You played in Ferndale, Magic Bang. You're in Detroit. And an excellent, excellent, excellent show. Should we tell them about the dressing room at the, the Magic Bang? <laughs> yeah. Yes, but I won't watch them. Okay. Uh, I mean, there, there's a wonderful German word that is uh, Kotzpizza. <coughs> which means uh, vomit pizza. <laughs> and there used to be one on the ceiling at the magic bag. Well, it's kind of unique because that ceiling is about 20 feet up there, so we always go in there wondering, how did, how did they get that up there? <laughs> so my question for uh, Mr. Lovin, um, basically the liquid tension experiment sessions, yeah. one, two, and three, tell me a little bit about them, your, your feedback, what was your favorite one, things like that. Okay, thank you for the question. First one, I didn't know the guys. We were kind of thrown together. It seemed like a good idea by the record label. We wrote this that kind of collaboration. You write it and record it in a week. So it was quick and I was amazed at the, uh, the virtuosity of the other guys and the way they could remember a song, or a riff. The other one guy would play a riff, the other guy would remember the right way. So I was lagging behind. Uh, in my youth, it seems like I was the guy the quickest to learn things, but in that band, I am always the slowest, and they kindly wait for the, the old guy to, to figure out the part. Uh, the second and third album were the same. The last album we did was uh, during the COVID lockdown, so it was a little risky. We formed a bubble and did that. And Again, it, I, I can't state it enough. Like, let's say John Petrucci would say, well, let's start the song like this, and he'd go super fast, and, and, and Jordan Rudis, would say, like this? Okay, got it. And I would be, can you show me the first four notes of that? And I would just start to learn it and I would like a pen out to write it on music paper. And, and, and then Mike Porter said, well, what if we then do this? And within 15, 20 minutes, it's a 10 minute long piece. I still got the pencil in my hands. I haven't played any of these riffs because I'm not that fast at learning them. So they're amazing, virtuosic at uh, learning things pretty quick, and you remember them too. Thanks for reminding me about that. Yeah. I, uh, this question is for Marcus. It's a kind of a double uh, two-question part. Um, I'm a big fan of your ambient stuff, your uh, solo projects. Uh, I was curious if you write all of that on your guitar, and also uh, if you have any tips for writing it. Uh, yes, I mean, the ambient music, I, I usually just play it on the guitar with, like, like I did this opening piece, opening piece, right? I have a laptop which I use as a recorder. So I play something and I can record it and I can manipulate it. I can slow it down, I can speed it up. And, uh, yeah, the, the, like, really the question about, like, how do you compose like that? Because I don't consider these pieces to be improvisations. Uh, Basically, I'm, I'm keeping track of the notes that I played, and you can think of music as you know, like like as a line, 
you know, a line of sound, but you can also collapse that sound into like into one chord, into a sound that exists like this rather than this, right? Everything at the same time. And I keep track of what I'm playing, I keep track of where the gaps are, both between the notes and also in time. And that's how I'm filling in the spaces and that's, that's how the compositions come about. And that would also be my recommendation if you want to do something, like learn to memorize what you played. still sound futuristic to this day. And this is one of them, this one's called Red.
what it looks like to you, what it feels like, the bass parts, things like that, and the piano. Oh, yeah. and, okay. Well, I, I, you know, one thing you notice when you play with stick players as a drummer, when you play with stick players, a lot busier than a bass player. There's a lot more notes going on. And especially with the Chapman stick, there's a lot more clack at the top of it. So it's, it really fulfills a lot of the kick drum right there off his fingertips, you know. Uh, but the other thing I notice is they almost always are looking down. So there's, it's not like the guitar players over here jiving, playing with me. They're, they're usually really focused on where their fingers are. And the other thing that occurs to me after playing with Kimo Fahoen, the accordion player, and Trey Gunn with the war guitar, is those instruments are like pianos. They could be playing the bass, they could play at the top, they could play chords, they could solo while they're playing chords or bass. So to me, it's kind of like they're each wearing a piano. A six octave, oct octave piano, but a piano nonetheless. So the two we're about to play, I think this is what Marcus wants me to tell you, is that they switch parts quite a bit in most of the tunes. But this is the one where he's primarily the bass player. You always think Tony's the bass player because he's Tony, the bass player. But in this case, it's Marcus' primary bass player through the whole piece, and Tony is the melody man. It's a piece called Cusp. Yeah.
doing so much talking tonight. But I guess that's okay. You know, I'm the only one who doesn't speak English. Uh, sometimes people want to want me to talk with my broad German accent, but it's very hard to do. It hurts me. <laughs> As it would you, I guess. <laughs> anyway, so this, this piece we're going to play now is, is very old. It's one of my pieces that I wrote when I was a teenager, before I was even considering to be a performer, before I was really playing a musical instrument, I was writing music. And, um, yeah, that was the time when I, when I for sure couldn't speak English. <laughs> but anyway, it has, an English, it has an English title. Now, it's called Swimming in Tea. And Swimming in Tea is also the title of that EP I mentioned, because we have a beautiful version of this piece on that EP, yes. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I don't know if you have this kind of experience sometimes that, you know, there is something from the past, a lot of times, at least for me, when I'm looking back, there are things that are either like, I remember them because they were sad or bad, or there are things that are, I kind of like glor glorify because it was wonderful, and I'm, you know, thinking back of that. But there's very little that is not really attached, you know, to strong emotions. But the funny thing is that this piece of music sort of like, seems to live a life on its own, and it doesn't have these kinds of connotations. Even now, since I brought this into the band about five years ago, like every night that we play, it feels fresh, it feels new, and it's uh, something beautiful, and I'm grateful that we're playing this piece together. It's called Swimming in Tea. Here we go.
2002. Um, it was Robert bringing in little modular pieces and we paste them together in different forms until we find the right order to put these A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, L, J, K, L, M, N, O, P parts. Gavin writes out charts, and I can tell you that's about how many sections there are that don't actually repeat exactly the same. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's a bit of a long one, and it's a bit of a heavy one. Sometimes it's brutal. We did the eight-piece crimson version, the seven-piece. We did the four-piece version back in 2002-3. We've been doing the trio version tonight. We're back to a four-piece. Okay, so it's called Level 5.
size CDs. She's got the T-shirt, which is exclusive to this tour. The limited edition uh, 300 versions of her swimming tea. If you notice, she set up a rack with the stick and stuff. There's also a rack over there with non-stick and stuff, which includes uh, some of Marcus's projects, some of my projects, uh, Tony Arnott's picks, which is not a uh, photo uh, DVD. It's some of the selections of other projects besides Steve Manning. Forgetting that she has over there. Um, see, some drum heads. The drum heads. Yeah, yeah, my, my drum heads. Uh, the few that represent like the logo that's on the kit. But I usually do a couple of scribbles before every show. So she's like, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, like, my, in fact, I've, I've got a brand new stick. I'll throw it to you here, buddy. If this is the right one, it is. Take a look there. That one's actually, I, I tried to draw it on the stick and send it to the stick company, so they've made me one there with a similar. It's very small, but it is my two buddies. And uh, somebody came down yesterday, and he asked if he was going to make, uh, 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 not far from here somewhere, the, the livery in uh, Benton Harbor. And uh, he was looking at the stage holding that drum in with the three of us and going, what about this guy? So I had to come out and update. And I'll do that for you if you like later. I'll try to update and add Elvin to the package there. We need a big hand for Frosa, who's been doing our sound since the Some of you already know this. I made this uh, non King Crimson, King Crimson record with my wife during COVID, just before we started, actually before COVID. Friends from the orchestra, a lot of friends helped me. We sort of tried to smooth out the edges and uh, make sort of a Crimson record maybe your non Crimson friends would enjoy. So it's uh, the softer side of Crim. And that's sort of my segue to the piece we're about to play. It's off the Discipline record, something the softer side of Crim. Thank you all very much. 